Welcome to Debut. And if you don't know about Debut, where you been? You gotta find out about it. It's where we take three amazing storytellers who are accomplished tellers, and they tell a story brand new for you because it's Debut for you. <laughs> Just came up with that. That's kind of fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, I digress. But let me tell you, uh, first, who I am. I'm Dr. Kevin Cordy. Uh, I'm the host and producer of Debut and the crazy practitioner of play. So we like to play, and so do the storytellers that I have on Debut. But we like to know a little bit about them. So let me tell you about our next teller. Our next teller is a professional storyteller and teaching artist based in Minnesota, or, or yes, um, Minneapolis. And she tells stories and has traveled all over the world, from U.S. to Canada to Italy to the United Arab, Arab Emirates. That's what's on paper. Let me tell you what I know about this teller. This teller is a commanding teller, is reflective about the process, is always teaching others. In fact, is, has a leadership position in the National Storytelling Network right now. But the one thing that I will say is she's a deep listener of her own work and other people. And because of that, I have seen other people develop under her. Uh, this next teller really knows that storytelling is about storytelling and story making, and most of all, story community. So let me welcome her to the debut family. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to bring in Katie Knutz. Hey, Katie! Hey, Kevin! It's so great to see you. You as well. I'm going to start with a question that I, I kind of always ask in some way. How did story find you or you find story? That's a two-part answer because <laughs> I, I was in high school forensics. And so I actually, as a freshman in high school, found this category called storytelling. And it, uh, I, I'm always up for a good challenge. And most of them required you to, you know, like prose, you had to pick one piece of prose and you would just recite that every meet. Storytelling, you had to learn five different stories and uh, be ready to give any one of them at any point whenever the judge selected that one. So it sounded like a fun challenge. I also like that you weren't supposed to memorize your stories. You were supposed to have them a little bit more improv based, which is true to actual storytelling. Uh, but I always thought that was just a, a you know high school forensics category. I didn't realize it was a career option until I was until I graduated college with a theater degree. I was working for a children's theater company in, uh, based in, in here in the Twin Cities, and I uh, was traveling with that theater company to a school in North Dakota. And they just happened to have a storyteller there at the same time that we were there. I met her. I grilled her like, wait, you do what? That's what I want to do. That's, that's my dream job. I didn't even I hadn't even heard her tell a story, but I already knew what what it was. And I knew that I wanted to do it. So um, she told me about the National Storytelling Network. Um, she might have also told me about Northlands or what was then um, North Star Storytelling League, now Story Arts of Minnesota. And, uh, but I, I started searching, you know, storytelling online and I found my first, uh, I found the NSN website and I went to my very first conference, uh, within a few months of that. It was, uh, the tw 2004, uh, conference in Bellingham, Washington. And I met you there and we had, a, 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 I still remember that you and Alton and I just sat on a couch in one of those dorms talking for many hours about what storytelling was and how to actually do this thing. Cause Alton and I were both brand new. I do remember that. That was a, that was a lot of fun uh, especially yeah. in, in Bellingham. And mm -hmm. one of our debut tellers is from Bellingham. Uh, so oh, wow. Um, so we will have much to share. But from the forensics coach, I am a former forensics coach or previous forensics coach. And I will tell you just a little tidbit. When I was, uh, when I was running yes, yes, Youth or Educators and Storytellers, uh, I talked to Catherine Wyndham. And I mm. said, I am working with Rachel Hedman. I said, uh, we would like forensics to be storytelling to be a category in all the states because it wasn't in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Catherine said, well, in Catherine's way, let me talk, <laughs> you know, and I mm -hmm. found out 
the, Catherine's neighbor was the head of the National Forensics League. Whoa. <laughs> so we were this close to having it to that category. But and, and, and it didn't uh, happen. It didn't, but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen because okay. I have seen storytelling more uh, represented um, mm -hmm. both um, at the National Forensics League at 4-H um, mm -hmm. at the Educational Theater uh, Alliance, which I know that you presented at. Um, mm -hmm. So it's great to see the sparks that storytelling had. And, and like I said at the beginning, storytelling community it was so great to, to just sit and talk story which is kind of what we're doing. So since that day in Bellingham or that day at uh, Forensics, uh, how has story changed for you? Well, oh boy, since Forensics, well, I learned that you don't <laughs> have to actually have your butt in a chair to be a storyteller. That was one of the weird rules of Wisconsin. Um, having moved to Minnesota, I learned that the rules for storytelling are completely different in Minnesota than they were in Wisconsin. Uh, but that was one of our big rules. Um, I've learned more about, you know, copyright issues and the ethics of storytelling. Uh, in high school, it was very much, okay, read a book, find this one story, modify it a little bit to make it your own, you know, make it more fun or do something more creative. But we weren't, uh, because we were high school students who were competing in high school competitions, we weren't bound by copyright. And so we could, you know, perform somebody's children's book without there being any repercussions. That is not okay as a professional storyteller. So there are certain things that I did in high school that I would never do now. Um, for example, I still have Dr. Seuss's The Sneetches memorized from beginning <laughs> to end. There is no way I will ever perform that um, publicly. Uh, for money, because that would be unethical, right? Um, even though I love that story and, um, you know, and, and can recite it at the drop of a hat. There are other things like that where I've, I've learned a lot about the craft of storytelling, you know, finding multiple versions of a story and not just going with the first one that you've found, uh, crafting my own stories and finding ways to uh, debut those stories, if you will, um, to, to try them out in front of an audience, because even... If I'm, if I feel like it's, you know, a solid story on my own, I will put it in front of an audience and learn, okay, well, no, that, that didn't land like I was expecting, or I got a laugh there and I wasn't expecting that. That's, um, that's either that's great because that's what I'm going for, or that's not okay because that's not the try to, kind of mood I'm trying to set. So I have to rework that. So it's, um, I learned a lot more about working in front of others too, and working with other storytellers in my community. It sounds like you also, um, even at a very young age, learned about from those comments and the reflections and uh, because you always looked and looked again at, you know, the story development processes. Um, mm -hmm. You think that serves you pretty well where you're continually being uh, reflective in an invite inviting way? Yeah. And I and actually in in high school, I was very. Um, I was really involved and invested in learning how to do it well. So I actually kept a journal when at, for every forensics meet that I went to, I would write down each person that told, I would write down the story that they told and then something about them to help me remember, you know, just visually who that storyteller was, you know, black flowery dress, or, right. you know, once I learned their names, I would just put their name, but it helped me to remember uh, who this person was and then I didn't get to see the judge's comments about those mm -hmm. tellers, but I got to see the the order that we were ranked. And so I would go back and say, okay, this order makes sense to me, or I wonder what the judge liked in this person's storytelling because that's not the way I would have ranked us. Um, so it helped me to learn a lot about the, uh, I guess the, not, there were, there were the rules for the category, you know, but also the impact and the power of storytelling. I, 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 don't think that ex exactly answered your no, question. So maybe answer that one more time. I think you did. And one thing alarmed me is that as a coach, I always gave the comments back to the students. And so I wonder if it was within the state or if it was a coach decision or because. We got our own comments. We just didn't get to see what they said about other people. I've got you. Okay. No. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And yeah, I would always pour over those and see what they had to say. But yes, I, I also I was curious about how they ranked us as well. 
because it was a competition. You, know? you and I have been in guilds and you and I, uh, well, I've started guilds and you probably have as well, but um, um, sometimes in guilds, and it's totally up to them, that they, they tell stories and there's very little feedback, unlike a friend meet. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, and we talked a little bit beforehand that, that I think visibly we need more feedback as storytellers. What do you think? I agree completely. Uh, so at my first NSN conference, I met a handful of other young storytellers, and I found out that one of them actually lived in Minnesota, not too far from me. So we became story buddies, and we started to get together, and we would share stories. And we'd spend maybe like 10 minutes telling a story, and then 25 minutes asking questions and giving feedback. And I believe at that conference, we had actually taken Doug Lipman's workshop on how to coach storytellers. And so we had this really great format to use that was very teller centered. Um, I'm so I've had a couple different story buddies throughout the year, throughout the years. Um, now I actually work with a small group of storytellers here in the Twin Cities area. And, you know, it's whoever can come on that Wednesday afternoon. It's so it's not necessarily the same people every time. Um, but we, we just get there and we say, okay, who's got a story today? And we say, what do you want from us? And then that teller gets to say, okay, I just need to tell this story or I really want to know, you know, uh, like I was just preparing for a festival and I said, okay, I'm thinking of telling this one for middle school students. If you could listen like middle schoolers and tell me, you know, what did you understand? What did you not like? What would have, what would have landed? What wouldn't? Um, and, and I find that that's very helpful to have, not just one person listening, but actually a small group of people who can all give feedback. So that critical question is, um, what, do you, what do you want from us? Listen to that. Unlike, you know, mm -hmm. a coach, uh, so the type of coach that says, you have to do this and they do this now. Mm -hmm. I think I remember you and Rose. I think you were talking about Rose. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember your faces lighting up when, when you realized that you could both work together. Um, mm -hmm. and, and create that kind of community and to have someone like Doug Lipman to be that, com that person that says, you know, we need to tell with honesty and compassion and appreciations. Mm -hmm. Uh, what a great start for something like yeah. that. But think about just that one question. What do you want from us? And in fact, um, I was just talking with a storyteller who said, you know, he, he enjoyed debut, but he thinks that. Um, a practice would be good, and I'm going to do it with you on the, okay. uh, this Sunday, where I say at the beginning, what do you want from us? Or what do you want from me mm -hmm. as I'm listening? Because I've done it indirectly, but I think I'm going to make it a direct thing. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that, that we can always go there, because in yep. play, we can go different directions with mm -hmm. the of everybody else. So that leads to this question. How has play been involved in your work as a story maker, storyteller, teacher, educator, or a one-line joke teller? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is um, instrumental, I think, is the best way to put it. I, I mean, in so in the, the and it kind of depends on the way you know I'm I'm thinking about play in that moment. So sometimes it looks like. Uh, you know, just, oh, there's a story that's kind of old and I'm, I'm, you know, it's not landing right anymore. And I want to play with this a little bit and uh, just try out a few new endings or I want to try out something. You know, so sometimes I just like experiment with uh, throwing out new ideas or new options. Um, I've in my work in the classrooms, it, it is completely play based. I mean, I, I warm up the kids with theater games. We do a lot of improv stuff. And then I will take the um, you know the framework of a story, and I will say, okay, you know, now you're going to make tableaus, which are frozen pictures. So the kids use their bodies to you know make a picture of something, and then they take those pictures and then they add their own words. And I say, you know, okay, so the tree doesn't actually speak in this uh, you know in this story. The tree is there to show the setting, but tree, what would you say? And um, so we you know we give voice to all of the things that are. The, the typical things you would think of, like the characters in the story. But I tell the kids that even if you run out of characters, every person in your group needs to be in every tableau. So there has, you know, they might be adding things like 
a, a, a tuffet. Uh, when we do a little, you know, little, little Miss Muffet, they might be adding um, the cupboard. They might be adding the sun. They might, you know, so there could be any number of things. And then those things eventually have to speak. And we talk about how can you add to the story as this thing without taking, you know, without taking away. So I think that there's a, um, a sense of play that I have, especially when I'm working with kids. Um, and, and, and I do also a lot of like creative theater stuff with kids. So it's very much based on like, okay, we've got this idea now let's explore and see where we go. And what do you think? And how can we add to that? So it's kind of this improv play background. Um, but I, uh, when you, I took a workshop that you did, oh, maybe was that in Kansas City? Uh, Unlikely. <laughs> it, was, it was a play-based workshop at an MSN conference. I know that much. I, and I, I love the- Go ahead. Um, and I just love the way that you had me thinking about play in a new way. So I'm really excited to do this because um, I kind of, I, I have my own ways of playing and uh, seeing how somebody else plays with the story or plays with the idea of storytelling, I think can be really interesting. Um, and again, uh, it's building that community, the, the, the community yeah. where we need, I actually call it we're dancing. We need to dance mm. in the world before we ever put something on paper about it. Um, I was actually just talking to a student and, and they said, well, you know, how do we make sure that we're not just teaching standards or whatever? And I said, you know, and, and then we put them to desks by themselves. I think we need to dance in the world. We need to do those tableaus. Mm -hmm. We need to be in the fiction that we're talking about. And just because you grow taller doesn't <laughs> mean that play's not necessary, right? Yeah. I mean, I was listening to the Emmys yesterday and they they credited Mick Napier who worked with the Annoyance Theater and, and Saturday Night mm. Live contenders. There was a bunch of improv people on the Emmys yesterday. My wife pointed her out because he, she's an improv comedian. Oh, uh, okay. I think we need to give ourselves permission to take risks and word dance mm -hmm. because if we sit you down and I'm going to ask you about your methods in a minute here. If we sit at an isolated desk, how are we supposed to be creative when we haven't thought about the world? We can handcuff ourselves to print. What do you think? How, when you Absolutely. come up with a story, do you go straight to print? Do you, uh, what do you do? No, I very rarely write my stories down, which I, I, part of me regrets because then I, you know, I spend all this time crafting it. And if I don't capture that, then I, uh, when I go back to tell it, you know, a year or two later, I have to do all of that work again to get it to, you know, the place where I can tell it again. Um, but I've, I've started to record myself, which is a little bit, um, it's, it's similar. Um, I honestly, nine times out of 10, find the process of actually writing a story out to be laborious and, um, usually not very effective because what I, for some reason, when I'm at a computer and I just start typing, I start elaborating and adding things. And when I, when I'm done typing it out, I've got these details in the story that are completely unnecessary and they are not, um, they're not going to serve me in an oral telling. So I think that working through it orally is the key for me when I'm working on any story. And that doesn't mean that I don't do any words. You know, I'll put, um, oh, actually, let me see if I have something right here. Um, eh, not like I was hoping. Um, I did, you know, I, I, like I was trying to figure out the order uh, in which to tell a story. And so I put all the different details on note cards and I wrote things out uh, and they were just a word or two. So that I could organize, you know, this little section of the story and this little section of the story. And I took those note cards and I put them in the order that I thought. And then I tried telling it to others. And I was like, okay, well, that order didn't work. And then I just mixed them up and played. And I was like, this wasn't necessary. That wasn't necessary. You know, so I can take those note cards and use them as a way to um, figure out what's important in my story. But having that visual representation is really helpful. So those could be you know, words, they can be images. Um, I know Elizabeth Ellis is a big fan of putting things like if you're going to talk about a key, you just draw a picture of a key. Um, and so it, it kind of depends on my mood, whether I draw or whether I write, but doing that or doing like a general outline, doing a story mountain, any of those kinds of things that are visual and, um, you know, tactile, those really help me.
Katie, you mentioned note cards and order. I have to tell mm -hmm. you, one of my favorite ever storytelling shows was Tom Bodette, who leaves the light on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He walked on stage, he had a stack of note cards, and he threw them up in the air. And he said, tell me where to go, and I'll begin the story where the cards are. And the wow. program was called Exploded. And for the huh? first six cards, we had no idea what he was saying. But it, it turned out of a story of him being electrocuted twice. Oh, my gosh. And by the time you were done with all the cards... You not only understood the story, but you felt the jolts, so to speak. It wow. was absolutely amazing. There was a guy named William Ackerman who actually said some things against Jane, Jonesboro, like, you know, everything doesn't have to happen in tents, which, you know, back then it was a little like, you know? <laughs> um, and he had the, the tribe of seven, which Spalding Gray was in, uh, uh, mm. Tom Bodet, and I can't remember all the others, and they created a CD. And they went on tour. And I will never forget Tom Bodette doing Exploded. So it makes me think about it. And it also makes me think that narratives aren't always linear. And the way that we mm -hmm. get to them, you know, because um, in school, the first thing they ask is for is plot. And as Donald Davis says, and Kemble Haven, we're plot obsessed. And nobody, uh, nobody earned a kingdom on plot. Right? You know, Lisa Cron says everything has plot. It's a matter mm -hmm. of character, and I say trouble that needs to move forward. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you find that you work with uh, when you're working with story? You're working this next, that next, that next, or you are all over the page, or what? Hmm. I it kind of depends on the story. I do like to plot things out on a story mountain to give myself a sense of, you know, where where the story is going with some stories. I mean, it, it really depends. If I'm writing my own personal story, doing something like the note cards or a story mountain or something can help me figure out what to leave in and what to take out. If I'm doing a, um, like a folk tale, I very rarely do that step because Folk tales, I mean, the the structure is there. So you don't have to worry about the plot right. as long as you remember all the details. What then I work on is um, building those images and getting those moments clear. Um, you know, because in the book, it will say something like, uh, she, she put the key in the lock and it clicked open, right? And so, you know, if then if I'm telling it, it might be, you know, she fumbled with the keys until she found the right one. She looked at that gold key. It was strictly forbidden to use it, but he wasn't there. He would never know. And so she took that gold key. She inserted it into the lock. And before she was even sure if she was going to turn it, it turned itself and the door swung open. You know, so they're like, I mean, you can so play a lot more. Yes. And it adds, it tells you more about the characters. It tells you more about the, the actions and it puts you in the moment. Right, rather than it being a cold telling. An APB. The folk to the folk tales were never meant to be flat. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. They might have been recorded as a you know the story mountain, and we say Dayumal raison d'etre. I think where's the trouble? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> instigate it a little bit. See where it goes from there. Um, and 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 just in that little exercise that you just did, you you gave it life, and mm -hmm. I think that's what we need to do when it's an oral tradition. Um, so it sounds like uh, plays both in your teaching, plays in your telling, and and in the way you create stories. Um, mm -hmm. I said at the beginning that you're a very good listener of what's happening in story. Um, and actually, uh, and I'll brag on you a little bit, um, uh, and I had the good fortune of editing a book called Tomorrow's Storytellers Today, which should be released this month, and Katie is in it. And to be <laughs> honest with you, she's one of the first people I called not only because I knew she had a powerful voice, but she knew the voices of those that could talk about, in addition to herself, tomorrow storytellers today. At the time, it was storytellers that were 35 and under, um, <laughs> or those who work with people 35 and under. And I'm biased, but I think it's an impressive collection. And you talk about competition. Could you talk, tease us a little bit on, on uh, what you think of competition in storytelling and how, uh, well, I'm not going to say any more. You, you have plenty to say. 
Um, okay, so storytelling. So I think when people say there's no competition in storytelling, they have never uh, thought about the back end of what happens to even produce a festival. There is inherent competition in storytelling when you are choosing between one storyteller and another. And whether that is an application process, whether that is something where you submit a story, whether that is uh, you know, just word of mouth and an interview or whatever it is that gets somebody there, anytime a storyteller is on stage, chances are other storytellers were not chosen to be in that spot. So I think that when we say that there, you know, storytelling is no place for competition, we aren't thinking about it with a wide angled lens because there is, there's always that inherent competition. Now, uh, when we make the competition more um, obvious, like in a story slam, that sometimes people complain about that. And the thing that I've found is when, when we compete in a story slam, the bar is raised just a little bit because you don't want to be the person who, you know, gets a really low score. You don't want to be the person who, um, you know, is way at the bottom and everybody else is way up here because you just got up there and rambled. Right. So there's um, there's an inherent little bit of upping your game when you know there's going to be a competition. Now, that is also true if you know you're going to be on a festival stage. Right. You're going to up your game. Um, so it's true in a lot of different ways. But and it's not like just just story just storytelling competitions will do that. But I found uh, that as an audience member, I enjoy going to slams significantly more than I enjoy going to swaps because a story swap is just people coming together and just sharing stories. Um, technically, I think that would actually be more of a story circle because of the idea of a swap is that I'm telling you a story that you can take with you. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's always used in that way. But uh, a story circle, you know, somebody will get up and say, oh, I just heard this story once and I just want to try it. And they and th there needs to be a place for that. Right. Because everybody has to have a place where they can try out a story. Um, but if you are as an audience member coming in and wanting to hear some good storytelling, I feel like a swap will uh, give you some gems and some duds. And you'll have fewer duds when you go to a um, like a slam or something that's competitive. Now, as a storyteller, if my context coming in is we are a bunch of people who are working on stories, then I would never call a story a dud, right? But if I'm if my context is I'm coming in to enjoy listening to something and it's just an open mic, I have been to some incredibly painful open mics. <laughs> So, Honestly, uh, I've been to some painful <laughs> slams too. Um, and, and, but the nice thing about a slam is that there's a very strict time limit. So if it's, you know, if it is a painful story, it's done in five minutes. Um, the, I've been to some story circles or some open mics where people um, have, have said some things that were so intense and revolting without any kind of a content warning that I felt like I was sinking down in my chair and I just wanted to disappear. Like I want, I, I was plugging my ears by the end and closing my eyes because it was so traumatic that I could not listen to it anymore. Um, and that was one person in particular and I won't mention names, but I think that I, we, I was sorry. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kevin, if we're going to put it out there, then okay. <laughs> But I, I think that having those, um, like just having your a, a good context and knowing what you're getting into is very helpful and having content warnings is super important. And you know, that's the other thing is that we just need to, we need to make room. And I know you advocate this as much that, that story, there's a lot of room under a tent in a bar, uh, you know, under an umbrella on a tightrope, you know, whatever, <laughs> um, there's not enough storytelling going on, so we don't need to close any doors. We can right. ask when when asked, when someone says, hey, what do you like about this? And they really mean it. We can say, oh, I would change this if it was me, or I could work here. But our job is not to oversee or overrule. Mm -hmm. um, and But not to ignore that there is competition. I remember one of my, you mentioned poor, you know, story slams or whatever. Uh, one of the first people to hire me um, had me tell at a coffee house for like four hours straight with no breaks and like 
I was just in storytelling. I, what? I, 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 exactly. And I didn't know to say no. <laughs> so I'm like telling whatever story I'd heard and worked on for two weeks. And, you know, and I, I was literally about two months out. And so they finally came up after the second hour and said, I think we should take breaks in between the stories. <laughs> but that's the other thing. We're all coming from a different place. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes because we make invisible the practice. I remember Donald Davis wrote in Storytelling World uh, his journey of a year. And I was mm -hmm. tired after reading it, let alone living it. All right. Um, we need to make, make, make our work visible for storytellers. And that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. for plight. Um, so why debut, Katie? Uh, well, because I really enjoyed your workshop. And um, I also, I have, I've been trying to think of, you know, what kind of story I want to tell. And I think the thing that, I would most benefit from uh, with play would be playing with a with a um, a tall tale. Um, I'm going to, I mean, like, because I we I was just at this festival and we were talking about a liar's contest, and I thought, you know, I don't really have anything for a liar's contest. You know, I want to have something that's kind of in my back pocket that I am I can pull out. Uh, I've got one story, but I think it needs a fair amount of work, and I and this is supposed to be a new thing. So I'm going to I'm working on a new story that we can, um, you know, just uh, bring from that place where you're like, oh yeah, this is this totally happened. This is a real thing to the place of unbelievable, and to have that um, just to, to play with that fun in there. So that's my plan. I may show up on Sunday with a completely different story, but. <laughs> And there's that's more, more demands right for liars contests, and I'm seeing more and more liars contests springing up. So that would be great. Nice. And I, you know, you're always fun to play with in story. So this this will be great, and, and and I'll enjoy it. So you just came back from Forest in the Hills. Is that am I saying that right? Or hunting, hunting in the hills. Hunting in the hills. And yep. um, before you were referring to working on stuff that's new, or at least within the the group that you work with. What is something that happened at Hunting in the Hills, either you're telling or you're listening to tellers, that surprised you in a good way that made you say, well, I'll keep that or I'll explore that or that was rich play or, you know, if you have nothing, that's OK. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so when I was up telling a story, I had, um, you know, done a like a run through, I think, earlier that morning to just check my timing and it was six minutes over and I was like, okay, that's not good. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking about what, and I always, I, when I'm practicing by myself, my stories are always slower. Like they, it just, it, I don't have an audience to feed oh, me yeah. their energy. And so I knew that it would, it would shorten itself naturally. But as I was up there, um, telling the story, um, which is called Fitcher's Bird, it's a variation that like, Bluebeard, Mr. Fox, the murder house is another name for this story. And I love um, they're all like slightly different uh, variations, but they're people, they're people. on a theme. <laughs> yeah, there's like there's a man who's a serial killer and there is a girl who or a young woman who gets away in some way. Right. Um, and then and, and puts an end to him in some fashion. <laughs> um, so. In this particular story, there are three sisters. And I mentioned, you know, the first sister, and I went through all of what she was doing, every every moment of her, you know, going to the house and um, the task she was given and how she failed it and then um, her death. And then the second sister, it was just, it was a summary, right? It was like the same thing happened. And I just walked through some of the, the, the moments. And then the third sister, um, I gave a little bit of flavor to why she was different than her sisters. And then I found myself just in the moment, which I hadn't done before, just giving like a phrase or a word to give a signpost to the audience right. of where we were in her progression. So I said something like, you know, the same thing happened. Um, you know, her hand glanced his and she felt her body being lifted up. She was in the basket running through the woods. Um, she saw those same signs, be bold, be bold, but, um, and then be bold, be bold, but not too bold. Click. 
She was in the house, out of the basket, and click, the door was locked behind her. Um, she was given the keys and the egg, and the man was gone. And so it was, um, you know, th that meant something to the audience. It might not have made any sense right there in what I was saying, because I had built it up moment by moment, detail by detail, uh, a little bit before that. And so they knew, but they they got the sense of, you know, I, I was carrying them with me on that journey, but I wasn't... Um, spelling out every moment i i i find it um they could fill in the pictures yes and it also it gives the audience credit you know it's yes, it's saying yes, to them you can think you can you know move forward you you're with me on this journey i don't need to spell out every moment for you and um it also just then i don't know it, it it's a little bit more trust you know, that I'm, I'm with you and you're with me and we're on this journey together. Um, then the stories where, you know, you, you spell out the same, that's one of my pet peeves. It's like when somebody, when there's, there's three brothers, know, three sisters, there. whatever, it's like, oh gosh, you're not going to tell us already. <laughs> thing, right? Like you're not going to give us all of those details in the exact same way for all three of these people. Right? Like that's, that feels like it's wasting my time as an audience member and it's not giving me any any credit for being able to think along with you or come forward with you in the story. So I usually don't talk about the next tellers that we have on debut, but one is Patrick, uh, and hopefully I'm saying his name right. He makes fun of that. He tells a story and then he stops <laughs> half the way and says, what is this guy doing? He's done it so many other times and I just loved it. So I'm like, you have to come to debut. <laughs> nice. What's his name? Um, Patrick, or Patrick, Patrick. Um, Patrick, okay. I don't yes, know him. yes, and I'll put it up on the on this little video so people will know. Okay, cool. <laughs> we're, we're 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 new friends. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, when is debut? Sunday. This Sunday. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, the time is different for many people, so why don't you give us the times? Because no, no worries. I, I'm on Central Time. I only know two o'clock Eastern, um, and, and it would be one p.m. Central. There you go, and, and then more amount, noon, and, and a different time it. entirely in Singapore. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I did pick these times because they were the most conducive for most of the people. But I, I don't know. You know, I've had calls from India and a number. We just hope we give them a good show, which I'm sure we will, Katie. Mm -hmm. Katie, um, whether you're a teacher, a teller, a listener, a community organizer, or just someone just diving into play, whether you're hunting in the hills or you're climbing a new hill, we so appreciate and value that you will be on debut. Katie Knudsen, you have the last word. Storytelling is really fun. It's a way for us to connect with one another. And I'm looking forward to playing.